fear, but Christ is near. Welcome everybody, friends. It's great to have you with us. And as you know, if you've been to Christadelphian talks before, you understand that Christadelphians believe that the Bible has the answers to all the problems facing our world. We've always said that, and we're going to be talking about that during this session, how that the Bible is the basis for hope for our world. In Acts chapter 1, we have the Lord Jesus Christ just outside the city of Jerusalem after he's been raised, having been crucified, raised from the dead. He's outside Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives with his disciples, and he's lifted up into heaven suddenly. And two angels appear as the disciples are looking up and wondering and worrying, what's happening now? The Lord is going up and ascending through the clouds. But the angels beside them say, this same Jesus will come again in the same manner you saw him go. And we're firmly of the belief that that time when he's coming again is very near at hand. You see all the signs that we're going to be talking about, some of them today, all the signs in our world where the world is fearful and worrying about what's going to happen and where is it all going to end. The Lord Jesus Christ is soon to return. And when he does come, he comes to raise from the dead everybody who's heard the message of God's salvation. And he's going to judge them according to their works. And he's going to give rewards to those who spent their lives, and we hope that's all of us here, spent their lives in honouring him and doing good to others. And he's going to give them everlasting life, living forever in this beautiful kingdom that he's going to set up upon this earth. But he is going to punish the vast majority of people who've rejected him and who've corrupted our world, and we see so much of that around us in our world today. And he's going to introduce some dramatic changes, many dramatic changes, to bring peace and harmony to all mankind around the world. That's our message for you today. But, you know, people just don't believe that these are the last days. We can talk on and on about these things to many people, and they'll simply say, no, no, we've heard all that sort of thing before. No, it's never going to happen. Uh, what you're talking is not realistic. Well, the Apostle Peter way back in the first century, wrote this letter saying that everybody should understand there will come in the last days, and we are in the last days, we're sure of that, scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Well, they say nothing's ever changed. You Christadelphians have been saying this for 150 or more years, but they are willingly ignorant, said the Apostle Peter, and that's very, very true. Now, in our news today, how many people, how many people, show of hands, have heard the word unprecedented in the news? <laughs> yes, that's right. They're, it's everywhere, isn't it? And uh, people are starting to get tired of hearing the word unprecedented, so some of the news readers are trying to come up with something different. Uh, we've never seen anything like this before. They are saying, but in fact, they're actually quoting words from the Bible. Daniel chapter 12 says, as you can see in the yellow, there will be a time of trouble such as never was, unprecedented. The Bible could have been translated that way. An unprecedented period of time since there was a nation even to that same time. That's the time when Michael, and of course, Michael, the great prince, is an Old Testament uh, name given to the Lord Jesus Christ because the name Michael means one who is like God. And Jesus Christ is going to stand in the last time, the time of the end, as Daniel chapter 11 in the later verses calls that time. And he's going to stand at that time, thy people shall be delivered. God's people will be delivered. Everyone who's found written in the book, the book of life of God, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That's the time of resurrection when Jesus returns. Some will be given everlasting life. We do hope that we'll all be among that number, but some will receive shame and everlasting contempt, those who've rejected the gospel message like we're giving to you now. So this time of the end is upon us, the unprecedented time. And uh, in fact, when Jesus was speaking not long before he was crucified on that Mount of Olives, he spoke a prophecy talking and as he's looking at the city of Jerusalem, not exactly the same as you can see on the picture there, but the old city of Jerusalem, which was a beautiful city in its day, they shall fall by the edge of the sword, the people of Jerusalem, because the Roman armies are going to come 
upon Jerusalem, as they certainly did in the year 70 AD, about 40 years after Jesus was crucified, they're going to be led away captive into all nations, as the Jews really were. But there's an end to it. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, as it was for nearly 2,000 years, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now that's actually happened. It's happened very, not very long ago, uh, very much in the lifetime of some of us here. Luke chapter 21 verse 24 was fulfilled in 1967. In 1967, in the Six-Day War, you can see a General Moshe Diane there, of course, uh, with the patch over his eye, marching into the city of Jerusalem and claiming it for the people of Israel, the Jews, after nearly 2,000 years. And there are the soldiers alongside the Wailing Wall, the holiest place for the uh, worship, the religion of the Jews. And, of course, they now uh, have complete control of that city, really. And uh, that's in fulfilment of the Bible prophecy. And that's a time that Jesus says is going to signify terrible times coming, but the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. He prophesied in that very same time, the very next verse. He says there's going to be a lot of trouble in the nations after 1967, after Jerusalem has been taken back by the Jews and is no longer trodden underfoot as it was by the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And at that time, there's going to be great distress of the nations. Well, there certainly has been, hasn't there? Since that time, in 1967, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have become uh, much more difficult to deal with as far as nations are concerned. And there's trouble around the world, distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring as if uh, nations are crashing against one another like the sea and the waves. And men's hearts... This is what we're talking about. This is our subject, in fact, for this talk. Men's hearts are failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth because nobody can control what's happening upon the earth. It's out of people's hands. It's out of the, the leaders' hands. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. They don't know what to do, the leaders. And then the prophecy says, Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. Remember, he went up with a cloud and... In fact, the angel said he's going to come again in the same way you saw him go, in a cloud, but this time with power and great glory to take control of our world. It's a wonderful picture and a wonderful hope. But certainly the prophecies are being fulfilled now with this great time of trouble that we're in and seeing around our world. So we will be looking at some of those things. You know, in fact, in the very same prophecy, Luke chapter 21, we're in the same chapter, Jesus says there are other things that are going to signify the time of the end, the last days before he returns. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, great earthquakes in diverse places and famines and pestilences. And the word pestilences there in the Bible means plagues, plagues like the virus we're seeing now and fearful sights. And that's the point. Fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Fear on every hand. And that's certainly the picture of our world today. Men's hearts are failing them for fear. So Jesus said this would signify the time when he's about to return. Now, there are so many signs of Jesus Christ's return. And some, of course, uh, mentioned there in that uh, verse we just looked at, the earthquakes, the famines, the troubles which are around our world that man has no real answer for. And these things seem to be happening more and more, and they certainly are. That's the sign that God is in control of the world and bringing us to the time when men will, in fact, be on their knees looking for some sort of solution, and the Lord Jesus Christ will return. We'll mention three of these most fearful things, of course. Number one, the coronavirus. Number two, Russia's preparations for war, and that's sending fear through many nations. And, of course, China's threat to our world. Well, we haven't known a fear like this one before. A hundred years ago, of course, was the Spanish flu, and uh, that was a fearful time. But this seems to have had a, a more, a greater impact upon the world in terms of the economy of the world, the livelihoods of people. Everybody seems to be affected by it. And of course, the news media uh, is actually, uh, I guess, spreading that fear in the way they're reporting this. And people are frightened, absolutely frightened. 
uh, by this terrible disease. And uh, indeed, I guess so they should be. But the impact, as we said, is not simply on people dying. It's a terrible thing that, is, that it is happening. Um, but more everybody is being affected because of the responses of the governments and the, uh, the, the terrible effect upon the economies and the incomes of people who are so dependent on their income because they're so much in debt. And that's causing lots of problems and indeed some suicides, which is terrible to know, but that's in fact what's happening in our world today. It's a Stretchers, time. row after row, comatose patients in isolation rooms. Every surface is dangerous, and so is the air, especially during an intubation. Every day you're thinking, am I going to get really sick? Am I going to be able to recover? Am I going to be one of those young people that, for whatever reason, dies from this? The history of this pandemic will be remembered not for briefings at the White House, but for the heartache in the hot zone. They're pulling out another one. Okay, we got Find that patient now. We need the patient to go upstairs, please. Dr. Deborah White reminds me of a general commanding a battlefield. I mean, this is what we train for. This is the moment in our career, because it's a once in a lifetime thing. She's trying to save lives. Yeah, for upstairs. for upstairs. While also keeping up morale. On this day, almost 800 New Yorkers died. Okay. Take some deep breaths, you're okay. Doctors and nurses are risking their lives. I was in the intensive care unit. The second patient who came in and was tested positive was a 27-year-old. I'm 29 right now. I spent 12 hours by his bedside with all my PPE on. He would grab my hand and I just kept telling him that everything is going to be okay. We were doing the best we could. But I could see the fear in his eyes. And it was heartbreaking because this is still so new to us. So you can see the fear in the eyes, even of the medical people there in that video, and of course in their patients who uh, you heard 800 people died in one day when that uh, video was filmed uh, over in New York, a terrible, terrible thing. And it's continuing to spread around our world. So coronavirus, in fact, is overwhelming our world. It has overwhelmed the world. It began in China and you can see it spread throughout the nations. In fact, uh, the spots are bigger and redder if you looked at a, a map uh, as of right now. So this is a terrible thing that is certainly a sign, though, as Jesus said, when pestilences will be seen, and there have been numerous of them, as we know. We can think of Ebola and we can think of other viruses which have been spreading, but this has really taken over our world. So when Jesus in the Olivet Prophecy uh, gave his answer to the disciples, the question that they had asked was, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And that's exactly what he was answering when he said, all these things will come to pass and they will grow and grow and become more and more difficult and, and men's hearts will be failing them for fear and there will great, be great distress of nations and no one will have any answers. Well, among other things, the other things he said was, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Well, that was China, and we're certainly going to be talking about China shortly. But let me ask you this question, first of all. Who is the most powerful, most feared man in the world? <laughs> yes, some would say, uh, somebody said Donald Trump. Well, uh, yes, <laughs> that's, that's certainly uh, got some truth in it. But really, even amongst the rulers of the world, who's the most feared man in the world? There he is. 
And President Putin has uh, just arranged for the, another change in the Constitution of Russia to allow him to continue to rule, as he does with an iron fist, right through if he wants to, until 2036. What a powerful man, and what a man that can't be trifled with by any other leader. He's shrewd, he's tough. And only, well, it was only last weekend that President Putin was there, and, and before him were 200 Russian warships parading up the river in St. Petersburg in front of him and many others, of course, of his dignitaries and fellow leaders in Russia. 200 of the latest and best equipped warships in his navy and he promised on that occasion that he's going to build another 40 new ships this year all with hypersonic nuclear missiles and of course underwater drones that can't be detected as well traveling at great speed too but hypersonic nuclear missiles nuclear tipped that can travel not supersonic but hypersonic more than 20 times the speed of sound that's an incredible thing. And, of course, it's a huge navy that he's building up. Because Daniel chapter 11 actually foreshadowed that the king of the north, and we're going to see clearly that that's Russia, the king of the north will come in the last days at the time of the end, this time we're talking about, the time in which we're living, with many ships down into the Middle East and around the land of Israel. Many ships. And, of course, he's building up that navy just as was predicted in our Bibles in Daniel chapter 11 at the time of the end. Now, in 2014, Russia took over the Crimea, took back the Crimea that had been there some time before, been battled over on and off for centuries, in fact. But they took over the Crimea, and of course the West couldn't do anything about it. The Crimea is there in the Black Sea, strategically situated, so that Russia will have access not only to the many ports on the Crimea, on the Black Sea, but the shipbuilding uh, yards that were there and that lay dormant for a while when Ukraine was in charge. But now it's, uh, they've been rebuilt and they are producing many of these ships that uh, Russia, President Putin is talking about, so that they can soon come down the Black Sea through Istanbul and into the Medi Mediterranean, so that the Mediterranean will in fact end up being virtually a Russian lake full of Russian ships uh, to support their invasion into the Middle East, which will pre precipitate Armageddon. To hear Vladimir Putin tell it, the cruise missile carried by this rocket is basically unstoppable. Flying at 20 times the speed of sound, it can zig and zag and deliver a nuclear warhead to any target in the world. It goes like a meteorite to its target, boasted Putin, like a fireball. It was a provocative Cold War-style threat, and the audience of lawmakers and business leaders loved it. The animation is sobering. Russian missiles that could circumnavigate the planet. Nuclear-powered cruise missiles hugging the terrain that could fly effectively forever with targets that could be anywhere in no bluff putin says he's not bluffing and he's right he can do this there aren't many things that russia can do well build big missiles and with large nuclear weapons on them that can destroy our country modernize and rebuild our nuclear arsenal hopefully never having to use it but making it so strong and so powerful that it will deter any acts of aggression. On should we be freaked out? We should be freaked out. Deterrence, just a fancy word for fear of what these weapons can do. The force of the atom bomb that demolished Hiroshima was around 15 kilotons. The force of maybe 15,000 tons of dynamite. The force of a modern nuclear weapon ranges up to 50 megatons. And there are a lot of them. North Korea has maybe 15, Israel, India, Pakistan, the UK, China, and France all have a lot more. And now, take a deep breath. The US and Russia stockpile... That's incredible, isn't it? All of those missiles, nuclear warheads that uh, are there, really, that Russia and, uh, and America control. But consider this, that uh, the Americans are well aware that they cannot possibly uh, meet the challenge at the present time presented by Russia's hypersonic missiles. Give you an idea. If 
a missile was seen or detected, uh, perhaps by radar, coming across Darwin, and it was heading towards the Gold Coast, where we are now. Give you an idea, 2,900 kilometres. If you're in a commercial jet flying, the time to fly would be four hours and seven minutes. Four hours. But a hypersonic missile, five minutes and 18 seconds. And we on the Gold Coast would be blown to smithereens. And all you'd have time to do if you did hear that it was coming across Darwin would be to hug the person closest to you and say goodbye. That's all. Well, the Bible's been talking about this time and saying the world will not destroy itself with nuclear weapons, but there is going to be a great time of conflict. And uh, as, as Jesus had said in uh, the Olivet Prophecy, uh, a, a time when kingdom will rise against kingdom and nation against nation. Joel, in his prophecy, says, prepare this among the Gentiles, proclaim this, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near and let them come up. Forget your uh, budget for uh, agriculture for the nation. Beat your plowshares into swords. In other words, put all your money into preparation for war. And if that's an entirely consistent with what uh, our Prime Minister here, Mr Morrison, said only a, a couple of weeks ago uh, with the threat of China looming, we're going to spend an extra $270 billion dollars to get ourselves ready uh, and, of course, to uh, uh, to concentrate on the development of missiles for Australia as well for our protection against perhaps a naval uh, sweep from the north. That would be from China, um, according to, uh, to our current strategists. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen. But in the bottom of that uh, screen, you can see Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. In other words, that's the indication that God is going to intervene. The world will not be totally destroyed. Uh, there will be great conflict, but God is in control. And the mighty ones of God will come down. That is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ and those who are with him to solve the problems of the world and ultimately to bring a glorious peace. Now, we often speak from this platform about uh, those powers that will come down from the north, and we mentioned Russia and its navy, but from the north, in the red there, you can see the major nations involved in this battle, which will in fact be the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, Rosh, uh, taken from Ezekiel chapter 38, and uh, we often give talks on that chapter. We can do that again soon. Um, Rosh, uh, the Prince of Rosh, uh, and uh, uh, of course that's Russia and its areas, including Meshek and Tubal, Moscow, Tobolsky, all around, Russia is a huge country, of course. Mago, representing Germany and Central Europe. Goma, the areas around France. And then you can see Tagama, just north of Israel, which is a, the nation of Turkey. Now, just to give you an idea of how close we are to this all becoming a fulfillment, uh, here is a picture, not taken very long ago, of the powers of Ezekiel chapter 38 combined together. Now, these powers were enemies in previous wars. But here we are, we have Rosh and Magog and Tugama and Goma, all countries there in Ezekiel 38, joined together, in, in fact, at a, a conference about what to do about the Middle East. And these countries will all be joined together, coming down into Israel. We're in these days, which are exciting for Bible students, for people who are looking at these events, knowing that this is going to bring a wonderful time, past the time of trouble, a wonderful time when the Lord Jesus Christ personally will reign upon the earth and we pray and hope that we will be with him in that wonderful time. But the invasion comes from the north and there the Battle of Armageddon takes place. As we said, that's the subject of probably another talk in the near future. Nevertheless, we're going to talk about China now. We know that uh, the, the great threat of China to our region is the taking over of the uh, South China Sea, and that's more or less a fait accompli. It's more or less happened, even though uh, some of our ships are going there to uh, join with the Americans and others at the present time uh, to conduct some uh, naval exercises in that area. It's more or less conceded by the military experts that China has made its move, it's uh, built its... Um, uh, its naval bases on uh, some of the islands in the region. It's building up its navy uh, tremendously rapidly. And it's a very powerful force, close to its own uh, region, of course. Uh, America's a long way away, and Australia's a long way away too, really. So there's very little that can be done 
they are in control of the South China Sea at the present time, under the present circumstances. And they're expanding in that region for many, many uh, centuries, in fact, thousands of years. Uh, China uh, confined itself to its own borders. Uh, it was uh, really self-contained in many ways. Uh, and in fact, towards the end of last century, as we would remember, uh, they adopted a one-child policy for families there in an endeavour to constrain the population. But now uh, they're economically strong. Uh, they feel that they can reach out and in fact expand their borders. 1.44 billion people in China uh, this year. That is a, an enormous population. So China is not just becoming a, a threat to our region, but indeed to the whole world. So what does the Bible say about China? Can we look at China and see some message from the Bible that will satisfy us as to what's going to happen to China in the last days? Well, to find out about China, we really need to go right back to the time of the flood. After the flood, remember, who were the three sons of Noah? Yes, there was Shem and Ham and Japheth, that's right. So Japheth uh, went off into the uh, areas of Europe and uh, represents the European, uh, the father of the European uh, peoples. Uh, Shem, of course, the Semitic peoples, uh, mainly today, I suppose you'd say, the uh, Jews and the Arabs. And Ham, Ham went uh, down to the south and across the uh, Sinai through uh, the area of Israel and Palestine and the Sinai and across to northern Africa and then spread around the world from there. Now the Bible said that after the flood the descendants of the uh, sons of Noah would be scattered abroad. It says that several times in Genesis 9, 10, 11 uh, we read about that. After the flood in the uh, uh, the uh, time of uh, the uh, book of Genesis, uh, 9, 10 and 11, those chapters, in Genesis chapter 10 in particular, we have a full rundown of the 70 descendants who formed the 70 nations of the world, as it was for some considerable time from those days. Looking at Ham, Ham had four sons. And in Genesis, uh, they're outlined for us, Canaan, Mitzrayim, uh, which is, of course, the uh, name Hebrew name for Egypt, uh, Cush, which represents to us uh, Ethiopia and the southern African nations, and Foot, who uh, was the father of the Libyans and the North African uh, peoples. And of course, they did spread abroad further from there. Now, from Canaan, Canaan actually had 11 sons. Among those 11 sons, we know some of the names, but there, in particular, there is the Sinite mentioned. Now, we talk about the Chinese as the Sino people. Uh, very often, you uh, would read uh, particularly I suppose in history uh, the Sino-Japanese war for example. Uh, Sino, uh, Sine is the uh, name we give for China uh, and in fact uh, there are 
many names uh, in the Ch Chinese history that sound like Xin or Xing or Sign is uh, the uh, the terminology uh, often related to the uh, Sino people, the Chinese. So in history, they are descended from Canaan. Now, what happened with Canaan and Ham uh, was that soon after the flood, Noah um, misbehaved really very much so. He uh, he was drunk and so drunk that he fell into a deep sleep. And uh, during that time, uh, a heinous act was committed on him by Ham, one of his uh, sons, and, and obviously Canaan, uh, one of uh, Ham's sons, were involved in this uh, event and uh, this incident. And when Noah woke and knew what had happened to him, he placed a curse particularly on Canaan. And he says of Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. Canaan will be the servant of Shem. Canaan will be the servant of Japheth. And when a man of God such as uh, Noah was, and a prophet of God, places a curse upon an individual like that, it's actually a curse which affects all of the descendants of that particular individual. So all the descendants of Canaan would be servants to other humans. So as a race, we might say, those who descended from Canaan would be servants uh, to uh, other nations. And that's in fact what's actually happened. Now, after the flood, the settlement of those uh, children of Ham, those descendants of Ham, we can see shown on the map here, uh, there is Mitzrayim, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, Cush further south uh, uh, into uh, all of Africa to the south and Libya, Africa yeah, in the northern areas. You can also see Asher, Assyria there, that's uh, one of the uh, Semitic descendants. And in the middle settled the Canaanites. The, there's actually a, uh, a description given of the border of most of the Canaanites uh, in uh, those chapters in Genesis 9, 10 and 11. Now the Sinites settled in, first of all, in the area below most of the other nations of Canaan, uh, in the area of Sinai, as we now have it. Uh, the wilderness of Sin is there, that's the same name, and uh, the Sinai and the Sinites. But over a period of time, they either grew too quickly or in some way they were driven out and scattered further afield. Uh, it may well have been the fact that uh, their whole area is uh, very much a desert and might not have been able to sustain uh, that, uh, that uh, group of people, the Sinites, as they grew. So they migrated. They were scattered abroad, to use the term from uh, Genesis. They were scattered abroad to the east. And many historians tell us uh, that now uh, you can see the descendants of the Sinites in the land of Sinim. In fact, that's a Bible term we'll look at too, the land of Sinim. So they are scattered abroad to the land of Sinim around the time of 2000-2100 BC. Uh, historians tell us that the earliest records they can find uh, of the Chinese people goes back to just before 2000 BC, which is about the same time as Abraham came down into the land known as the land of promise and uh, found that the Canaanites were there. Well, the majority of the Canaanites were still there, but the Sinites had translated and migrated across to this beautiful country they found, travelling through the desert for so long. They came to the farthest east of the Eurasian landmass and found a beautiful country there where they could settle and be self-contained as they remained for nearly 4,000 years. Uh, that country is known, uh, that area is known as the most fertile country on the whole of that Eurasian landmass. And that's mainly because of the two great rivers, the Yellow River and the Yangtze River, uh, which come down from the Himalaya mountains. And of course, uh, they come through Tibet, which is why China is so keen on maintaining control of Tibet, because that's where the main water supply comes down. And those rivers uh, water that whole region. Uh, of uh, mainly, I suppose you'd say, southern China, uh, very fertile. They can uh, they can run two crops a year there, and for as we said, nearly four thousand years, they were totally self-contained there, and they had everything they needed. They had gold and silver. They could mine coal. They could uh, uh, create their industry. Um, 
and uh, they had uh, uh, completely self-sustained as far as food was concerned. They need no needed nothing from any other country so they could remain self-contained. Well, it's only in the last 40 years that they have seen found the need to, to expand. And they've actually tried to break out, to break free of the curse that came from God through Noah to Canaan and all his descendants. And uh, of course, today, the only Canaanites we can find in the earth, as uh, uh, clearly indicated as uh, descendants uh, of the Canaanites, is the Chinese people. And uh, in recent times, I suppose uh, we could say they've still been servants to the world in many ways. They are very um, diligent workers. Uh, they're quite inventive. And uh, you know, if you've seen uh, photographs or movies or actually been to some of their factories, uh, you will know that the vast numbers of people work in their factories and uh, quite diligently and happily so for long hours and, and certainly in times gone by for quite little pay. Anybody here got an iPhone? <laughs> yes, well, there you go. Uh, China, of course, very strong on production of uh, electronics, clothing, all sorts of things. And uh, uh, I think the, the nations of the world have been very happy to use their labour, and they've been uh, happy, in a sense, to, uh, to be servants to the world. That's fulfilling prophecy. But in more recent times, no, they're trying to break out of it. In the kingdom of God, China will be a very diminished nation. How do we know that? In Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 21, the last verse of uh, Zechariah, the second last, we read, and that's a chapter which deals with the kingdom of God and with uh, people going up from nations around the world to worship God in Jerusalem. There's a comment made at the close. There will be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Now, we know that there are going to be some exceptions to that. There often are exceptions to that. But that's the broad term, the broad message. They'll, the Canaanites will be of no significance, in other words, in the kingdom. Uh, think of one of the Canaanites we know just off the top of uh, my head, the Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite was a Canaanite. Now, he was a very, very faithful man in the days of King David, um, he was a Canaanite, but he'll be there, no doubt, in the kingdom of God. Uh, we also read that uh, one of Jesus' disciples was Simon the Canaanite. Now, there are some uh, comments uh, about whether or not that really means the Canaanite, but certainly he was uh, one uh, termed and translated as a Canaanite, but uh, one of showing the characteristics, perhaps, of the Canaanites and uh, uh, actually... Uh, uh, some uh, translations have that he was uh, a rebel. Well, uh, so the Canaanites uh, <laughs> certainly have, were rebellious in the in early days and, and developed that characteristic. Nevertheless, there we are. There are some, going to be some Canaanites. There won't be many Canaanites. There will be no significance to the Canaanites. And that means descendants of Canaanites, the Chinese people too. And there we read in Isaiah chapter 49 about the land of Sinim, the land of China. And the vast majority of commentators accept that this is, this is China. Uh, Ptolemy, way back in history, a uh, uh, historian and geographer from Egypt, uh, tells us that uh, the Sino people um, uh, were, was the name given, the current the name of, in his day for the people from China. They didn't know much about them. They were a long way away back in his day. And uh, there wasn't much communication, really. But he did speak about the people of Sinim. So Isaiah, in his prophecy, is talking. Uh, there are dual applications in uh, Isaiah chapter 49. But the vast majority of the chapter is talking about the kingdom of God. See at the uh, bottom of the screen there. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. It's the time when Israel is restored and the kingdom of God is established and Jesus is reigning in Jerusalem. And people will come, as Zechariah 14 spoke about nations coming to Jerusalem to worship. Here's a parallel message. These shall come from far. And lo, these from the north and from the west, and the only country that's named, these from the land of Sinim. What a surprise. What a surprise. How incredible. These people, this really insignificant country now in the kingdom, 
from the land of Sodom. These people, even these who've been so godless down through the centuries, are coming to the land of Israel to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, Jesus Christ, in Jerusalem. So, yes, the people from Sinai will be coming. There will be some, but there won't be many. It's an insignificant country in that sense. Lo, these from the land of Sinai. Well, 40 years ago, 1978, China sets out on its march to the market. At that point, what percentage of China's 1 billion citizens were struggling to survive on less than $2 a day? Take a guess. 25%? 50? 75? 90? What do you think? 90. Nine out of every 10 on less than $2 a day. 2018, 40 years later. What about the numbers? What's your bet? Take a look. Fewer than one in a hundred today. And China's president has promised that within the next three years, those last tens of millions will have been raised up above that threshold. So it's a miracle, actually, in our lifetime. A seemingly unstoppable rising China, accelerating towards an apparently immovable ruling U.S., on course for what could be the grandest collision in history. Uh, former Czech president, Václav Havel, I think, put it best. He said, all this has happened so fast, we haven't yet had time to be astonished. <laughs> okay. To remind myself how astonished I should be, I occasionally look out the window in my office in Cambridge at this bridge which goes across the Charles River between the Kennedy School and Harvard Business School. In 2012, the state of Massachusetts said they were going to renovate this bridge. It would take two years. In 2014, they said it wasn't finished. Uh, in 2015, they said it would take one more year. In 2015, they said it's not finished. We're not going to tell you when it's going to be finished. <laughs> Finally, last year, it was finished three times over budget. Now, compare this to a similar bridge that I drove across last month in Beijing. It's called the Senyan Bridge. In 2015, the Chinese decided they wanted to renovate that bridge. It actually has twice as many lanes of traffic. How long did it take for them to complete the project? 2015. What do you bet? Take a guess. Okay. Take a look. The answer is 43 hours. <laughs> Compare the U.S. and China to kids on opposite ends of a seesaw on a playground, each represented by the size of their economy. As late as 2004, China was just half our size. By 2014, its GDP was equal to ours. And on the current trajectory, by 2024, it'll be half again larger. The consequences of this tectonic change will be felt everywhere. The past 500 years have seen 16 cases in which a rising power threatened to displace a ruling power. Twelve of those ended in war. Now, with China rising so quickly as they have done over the last 40 years to become such a, a dominant player, we might say, in the world today, the question has been asked by many people, how is China ever going to be put back in the bottle, like a genie coming out of the bottle, as they have, they sprung out of the bottle. How are they going to be put back in the bottle? And there have been uh, numerous articles actually written with that kind of a headline or that kind of a message that I've been reading of recent times. And nobody really has a, a definite answer on it, but uh, it's interesting that the genie, when he comes out of the lamp, gives three wishes. <laughs> and, and I really believe that there are probably three different ways in which China will be diminished. They are the possibility of war. Uh, China, interestingly, hasn't ever really won a significant war. 
Uh, in fact, they've generally managed to put people offside all around them. China has very, very few friends today. Uh, some might think, well, the Russians are their friends. No, not really. Um, just recently, China has laid claim to Russian territory. Vladivostok, the far eastern port of Russia, China says, oh, we want that territory. That's close enough to us. We want it. And uh, in many ways, uh, there might be a business relationship between um, President Putin of Russia and the Chinese, but uh, they're not really friends. Now, there could also be chemical or germ warfare. Uh, I'm not just talking about the, the natural disease, but the possibility of, the, of that being uh, something which would be used to uh, minimise their population. Um, we're not uh, predicting that at all, but that's a possibility. There's also the, the threat uh, of a limited nuclear war in that region, and uh, that was raised again just recently when there was a, a, a conflict, uh, more than a scuffle, uh, between the Indians, uh, people of India, the Indian forces on their northern border, uh, and the Chinese. And uh, the suggestion was made that uh, both countries do have nuclear weapons and there could possibly be a, a limited nuclear war. They did have a uh, quite a uh, uh, significant tussle there uh, just over 30 years ago, or around 30 years ago. Uh, and at that time, people suggested, well, what would happen if there was a, a limited nuclear war in that region? And the answer was a huge nuclear winter would uh, descend upon most of the world as a result of that. That's a possibility. Uh, there was also the thought that uh, economic warfare might uh, reduce them, and we know already that uh, many countries are saying we shouldn't be so dependent on China. So, uh, Australia is certainly saying that. But to reduce uh, economic dependence on China when so many countries have been caught up uh, in uh, utilising China to produce their, their goods and uh, trading with China in, just, in such a significant way, it would take quite a while to, for countries to wean themselves off their dependence on China for so many products. And uh, it doesn't seem as though we've got that much time before our Lord Jesus Christ would return. Uh, that would take too long. So that's uh, a possibility, but uh, uh, a remote possibility. Another thought is revolution. And China is very familiar with uh, the effects of revolution because for the last 100 years or, or more, uh, they, have, uh, they have been involved in revolution and the consequences of revolution. Uh, and in fact, uh, Mao Zedong, who eventually came to power as a result of uh, revolutionary activity, which had gone on for close on 50 years, um, uh, he diminished his population when he brought in uh, the, the concept of changing China into an industrial society and reducing their dependence upon uh, the farming community and turning uh, the people who were on farms into uh, uh, workers in industry, uh, actually uh, put people on farms in a kind of a commune situation, which resulted in the starvation death over about four years of about 50 million people. And then when he realised he wasn't going the right, on the right track there, uh, he purged all those people who disagreed with him and the Communist Party, and that resulted in many, many tens of millions more dying. Revolution certainly could have an effect of reducing the population and the power of China. But more likely, perhaps, than any of those things is that God will bring destruction. It could be through disease, along the lines of the coronavirus, could be through floods or earthquakes or a combination of all those things. All these things are possible. What we do know is that China will be significantly reduced. The curse was given there way back in Genesis and it will uh, have its effect. Well, brethren and sisters and friends, Jesus is coming soon. He comes to judge the world. We've seen how the world is in fear in many ways, of course, we've seen some of those ways. But there is a good reason for the world to be in fear. Jesus said there will be fearful signs. Fearful things will be happening in the world just before I return. So fearful that men's hearts will be failing them. 
so fearful that it will be distress of nations with perplexity, no apparent way out of all of the problems confronting the world. And aren't they coming? One upon another, one upon another, one after the other, uh, to a greater degree. Uh, so it's almost like uh, birth pangs, where the pains are getting quicker and quicker and quicker before the child is to be born. And that's a Bible symbol telling us that there will be great pains in the world before the, the Lord Jesus Christ, the expected child, the Son, the Son who will return, comes to judge the world. God has appointed the day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, where he hath given assurance to all men, because he raised him from the dead. And that, of course, is the great thing that we're looking for, the return of Jesus to raise the dead and to judge our world righteously and bring in lasting peace, lasting and wonderful changes to bring our world back to God. Jesus told a parable. You might have heard of this parable. The parable of ten virgins or bridesmaids who are waiting for the bridegroom to come. And this is to do, of course, with the tradition of the time of Jesus where there would be uh, many young bridesmaids who would uh, accompany the bridegroom to the wedding. And they would be waiting for him to arrive and uh, meeting him and going with him to the marriage feast. Well, they didn't know when he was going to arrive, but uh, in case he arrived at night, five of those virgins were wise and they had prepared that if he did come at night, they would have their lamps bright and burning to be able to light the way for the bridegroom. On the other hand, five of them were foolish. They had no oil ready for their lamps. And when the bridegroom did come, in the middle of the night, they weren't ready. And so the message is for us to be ready with our lights burning, meaning to say, of course, meaning that we have embraced the word of God and we're using the word of God to light up our lives. And it does. It lights up our lives. It helps us to show forth and to know the way and to walk in the way which is right and good because we can see it from understanding the word of God and understanding what God has for us in this life and in the future life. So when Jesus returns, these girls represent those who are faithful and ready. The message from Jesus is, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour where the son of, wherein the Son of Man cometh. And we as Christians don't know precisely the hour. We know it's very, very soon though because we're seeing all the signs and some of those signs Jesus mentioned are fearful signs, signs that we're seeing around us in the world today. And that's what we've been talking about. Jesus said, when I come, there will be all these fearful things happening on the earth, but I'm going to take the faithful people out of these terrible times and protect them and keep them safe until God's judgments have ended upon the world and I am about to reign in peace and righteousness upon the earth. And those who've kept their lamps burning will be with me in that wonderful day. That's the message of that parable. So the Lord Jesus Christ is about to return. And for us, it's important that we trim our lamps and be ready. Thank you.